geomagnetic storm watch, minor G1 class storms may be at us on May 11th as coronal mass ejection CME grazes our Earth's magnetic field. This is from Space Weather, today's report. It's concerning the CME from sunspot AR2740, which propelled the solar storm cloud into our direction three days ago. Auroras could appear as far south as the U.S.-Canadian border. Another solar flare, May 9, began with a bang. Big sunspot AR2740 produced another solar flare, this time the impulsive C7 category explosion. Telescopes on board NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory captured the extreme ultraviolet flash. Now, what is a C7 flare? The classification of X-ray solar flares. A solar flare, as we know, is the expulsion of the sun on the sun that happens when energy stored in twisted magnetic fields, usually above the sunspots, suddenly are released. And flares produce a burst of radiation across the electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves to X-rays and gamma rays. And they go through the uh, plasma universe, as we know. Now, scientists, uh, first of all, it's not a void. It's a plasma universe. And you'll see the video uh, concerning NASA's explanation. It's about a two-hour video. It's um, old, but we have a fantastic analysis because we have very famous speakers, one of them being Dr. Van Allen, who discovered the Van Allen radiation belts. And they talk about interstellar space travel in there and solar radiation from solar flares, uh, as well as uh, galactic radiation. Now, uh, the uh, scientists classify the solar flares according to their X-ray brightness and the wavelength ranging from one to eight angstroms. And there are three categories. The X-class flares are big. They are major events that can trigger planet-wide radio blackouts and long-lasting radiation storms. M-class flares are the medium size, and they can cause brief radio blackouts that affect Earth's polar regions. Minor radiation storms sometimes follow the M-class flares. Compared to X, the M-class events, C-class flares are small with few noticeable consequences here on Earth. Each category for X-ray flares has nine subdivisions, ranging from C1 to C9, for example, M1 to M9, and X1 to X9. We're expecting a C7. So that's not small. C7 is just before, for example, the C9 and uh, M-class flare, medium size, causing brief radio blackouts that affect Earth's polar regions. Minor radiation storms sometimes follow, as we said. The C-class flares are small with few noticeable consequences on Earth, but they can have an effect on migratory birds. Radiation from the flare briefly ionizes the top of Earth's atmosphere, causing a brownout of shortwave radio radiation over Asia and the Indian Ocean. Frequencies affected were mainly below 20 megahertz. Ham radio operators and ships at sea using shortwave transceivers may have noticed the disturbance on May 9th around 5.50 UT in the morning. And this is the upcoming map of it. As you can see, the high fre highest frequency is just about above India and China and Mongolia. The high latitude protons in the area. This is from, again, from space weather. Now, what they've done also in the stratosphere is that they have placed a sample of halobacteria there. If there's life on Mars, it could have a cousin on Earth, halobacteria. Astrobiologists have long thought that the salt-loving extromophile might be able to survive conditions on the red planet. 
and to find out, the students of Earth to Sky Calculus have flown approximately 100 billions of the microbes into the stratosphere, and they're inside test tubes 113,000 feet above the snow-capped Sierras of Central California. The microbes hitched the ride on a cosmic ray balloon, which the students launched about once a week to monitor atmospheric radiation. After a three-hour flight on April 28th, they parachuted back to Earth, landing in a Joshua Tree forest in western Nevada. Now, why send halobacteria to the stratosphere? Because conditions in Earth's stratosphere are remarkably similar to the surface of Mars. Low air pressure, strong ultraviolet radiation, extremely low temperatures, intense cosmic rays. So visiting the stratosphere is like taking a trip to the red planet. The microscopic astronauts, the halobacteria, are now being cultured in an incubator in Earth to Sky's makeshift biology lab. So we have to stay tuned to learn more as to what happened to them and how many survived. As far as this fireball situation, All Sky Fireball Network, every night this network of NASA All Sky cameras scans the skies above the United States for meteoric fireballs. Automated software maintained by NASA's Meteoroid Environment Office calculates the orbits, velocity, velocity penetration depth into Earth's atmosphere, and other characteristics, and daily results are presented here on Space Weather. And today, the network reported 18 fireballs coming to Earth. As far as the near-Earth asteroids are concerned, the potentially hazardous asteroids PHAs, the space rocks larger than about 300 feet across, that can come closer to Earth, closer than 0.05 AU. An AU, as we know, is the distance between the Sun and the Earth. None of the known PHAs is on a collision course with our planet, although astronomers are finding new ones all the time. May 9th, 2019, as of that date, there were 1,983 potentially hazardous asteroids. And you can see the chart here, I'll leave below for you in the link in the, in the description box. Now, as for the ERAD, this is something new, the cosmic rays in our atmosphere. They predict models of aviation radiation called ERAD, short for Empirical Radiation Model. They're constantly flying radiation sensors on board airplanes over the US and around the world, so far collected more than 22,000 GPS-tagged radiation measurements. Using this unique data set, they predict the dosage on any flight over the U.S. with an error no worse than 15%. ERAD lets us do something new. Every day we monitor approximately 1,400 flights, crisscrossing the 10 busiest routes in the continental U.S., and this includes more than 80,000 passengers per day. ERAD calculates radiation exposure for every single flight. The hot flight table says, you can see here in the summary, showing the five charter flights with the biggest, highest dosage rates and five commercial flights. With the highest dosage rates, five commercial flights, there are near average dose rates. Uh, now you can say that passengers typically experience dose rates that are 20 to 70 times higher than natural radiation at sea levels, especially if they're higher up in the uh, atmosphere, and especially, of course, uh, the destination, how many hours is the duration of the flight. So, for example, if you're going at 45,000 feet altitude flight for about 3 hours 40 minutes, you have a dose rate at sea level of 73 Point five, Amazing. Whereas if you're traveling at 24,000 feet, that's about 20,000 feet less, at um, 2 hours and 20 minutes flight, New York to Atlanta, for example, you only have 18.3 as a dosage. So that's about uh, 4 times less. Amazing. 
To measure the radiation on airplanes, they use the same sensors used to fly to the stratosphere on board Earth to, si to sky calculus cosmic ray balloons, neutron bubble chambers, and X ray gamma ray Geiger tubes sensitive to energies between 10 keV and 20 MeV. These energies span the range of medical X ray machines and airport security cameras. Now also space weather balloon data approximately once a week. Space weather and the students from Earth to Sky Calculus fly space weather balloons into the stratosphere over California. The balloons are equipped with radiation sensors that detect cosmic rays. Surprisingly down-to-earth form of space weather, but it works. Cosmic rays can seed clouds, trigger lightning, and penetrate commercial airplanes. Also, there are studies linking cosmic rays with cardiac arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death in the general population. Our latest measurement shows that cosmic rays are intensifying with an increase of more than 18% in four years. 18% in four years. Say a fifth in four years. Unbelievably astonishing. And it's going on, it's increasing. The data points correspond to the peak of the Reniger Fodser Maximum, lying about 67,000 feet above central California. When cosmic rays crash into Earth's atmosphere, they produce a spray of secondary particles that is most intense in the entrance to the stratosphere. Physicist Eric Zrenkin and George Fodser discovered the maximum using balloons in the 1930s, and it, it's what uh, they used to measure today. Now, in this plot, the dose rates expressed as multiples of sea level. For instance, we see that boarding a plane that flies at 25,000 feet exposes passengers to a dose 10 times higher than at sea level, whereas if you're flying at 40,000 feet, the multiplier is close to 50 times that of sea level. Amazing. So uh, the radiation, the higher you go up, and uh, incrementally, it's a lot more. Uh, the radiation sensors on board helium balloons detect X-rays, gamma rays, and the energy range 10 keV to 20 MeV, energy spanning range of medical X-ray machines and airport security scanners. Now, why are cosmic rays intensifying? The main reason is the sun. Solar storm clouds, such as coronal mass ejections, CMEs, sweep aside cosmic rays when they pass the Earth. During solar maximum, CMEs are abundant and cosmic rays are held at bay. But now, the solar cycle is swinging towards solar minimum, which means that we have less CMEs and therefore more cosmic rays entering into our atmosphere. Another reason could be the weakening of Earth's magnetic field, which helps protect us from deep space radiation. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.